Daremos início ao terceiro painel. Os debates serão moderados pelo professor Antônio Jorge Ramalho. Convidamos o moderador e os painelistas Carl Cheng, Roberto Galo, Shen Yong Kan, Moa Carlson e o vice-almirante Alfredo Martins Muradas para ocuparem a mesa de debates. Cada debatedor terá um tempo máximo de 20 minutos para a sua apresentação. Imediatamente, seguir-se-á um período de debates de até 30 minutos, devendo o painel encerrar-se às 18h40. Com a palavra, o moderador. Good afternoon, everyone. I think I should switch to Portuguese so that we will. Um, make it more balanced uh, in terms of the participation of everyone. Um, eu queria então agradecer uma vez mais, congratular o embaixador Candeias pela organização desse evento, muito oportuno. Agradecer à Escola de Carnaval e à Marinha do Brasil por hospedar é, o evento e por ajudar a concebê-lo, a promovê-lo, num momento, num período tão difícil um momento de mudanças importantes no cenário internacional, que sempre, como qualquer momento de grandes transformações, este nos traz muitas incertezas, muitos riscos, mas também oportunidades. E aqui os senhores têm a oportunidade de entender melhor as posições mútuas e, com isso, propor uma solução para um problema que ah, foi criado pelo homem. É, a única, o único aspecto claro para todos nós é que este, esta é uma mudança revolucionária, esta é uma tecnologia revolucionária é, que vai produzir transformações muito rapidamente, mais rapidamente ainda do que outras tecnologias revolucionárias que transformaram as nossas vidas, como foi o caso da máquina a vapor, como foi o caso da energia elétrica, como foi o caso da própria tecnologia da informação. É, sabemos de algumas coisas, sabemos que nesses tempos de incerteza e grande instabilidade, a multipolaridade se fortalece enquanto o sistema multilateral vem se enfraquecendo. Sabemos que a própria forma de fazer a guerra é, vem sendo questionada. Há quem diga que estamos vivendo uma quarta geração da guerra, quando certas práticas do passado, como recurso a a, a, o engano quando o recurso a operações psicológicas complexas, quando o recurso a atos terroristas eram comuns na guerra. Não, mas felizmente temos aqui um grupo de painelistas capazes, inteligentes, perspicazes, que vão nos ajudar a entender o significado desta nova tecnologia na guerra contemporânea. É, o painel trata, como os senhores sabem, da dimensão estratégica e militar das armas autônomas, se a tecnologia é disruptiva, se ela é um divisor de águas, em que medida? Temos, eh, vamos seguir a ordem que consta no programa com eh, o conselheiro geral associado do Departamento de Defesa dos Estados Unidos, Carl Chang, seguido do Dr. Roberto Galo, eh, a presidente da Associação Brasileira das Indústrias de Materiais de Defesa e Segurança. Okay. 
Depois dele, a senhora, a, a doutora Moa Peldon Carson, do, do CIPRI, conhecido de todos nós, e concluímos com a apresentação do vice-almirante Alfredo Muradas, diretor de Sistemas de Armas da Marinha do Brasil. O senhor tem diante de si, portanto, um tema bastante complexo, algumas questões conhecidas, é, outras questões sobre as quais a, a, os líderes mundiais também tiveram de se posicionar do ponto de vista ético, as questões éticas que foram levantadas aqui nos painéis que nos antecederam, também foram levantadas, por exemplo, quando da invenção do submarino, não se considerava ético um ataque vindo de alguém que não se podia ver. A mesma coisa se levantou quando no emprego do poder aéreo. Uh, questões semelhantes foram empregadas também quando uh, sistemas fora da Terra, posicionados fora do planeta Terra, passaram a ser usados para apoiar uh, o combate. Uh, ali também, em todas essas ocasiões, houve questões éticas e uh, os líderes se posicionaram com respeito a isso. Uh, na opinião dos senhores, então, vejamos se, se as nossas lideranças serão capazes também de se posicionar de uma forma construtiva com relação a este novo desafio desafio tecnológico que, se é disruptivo, nos traz alguns problemas já conhecidos da humanidade. Dito isso, passo imediatamente a palavra ao conselheiro Carl Chang. Thank you for the kind introduction. Also, thank you to the government of Brazil, uh, Ambassador Candeias, uh, specifically, and other Brazilian colleagues for their hospitality and leadership on, on this issue. Uh, would also like to thank, of course, the distinguished panelists for their presentations and, and really everybody who's contributed to these discussions. They've really helped uh, enrich my understanding uh, of the issue, and, and I'm hopeful that others can gain a, a better understanding of the U.S. perspective uh, in, in these discussions. I will begin with a few observations on aspects of the strategic and military dimensions of emerging technologies in the area of laws. Uh, these include uncertainty about the course of technological development, potential strategic significance, including game-changing disruption, and increased speed, accuracy, and precision in decision-making and the use of force in combat operations. Second, I want to discuss why these aspects make it difficult to apply to emerging technologies in the area of laws, the disarmament or arms control approaches that have been applied to other types of weapons in the past. Third, I would like to explain how the strategic and military implications indicate uh, that the GGE should focus its work on four related areas. First, more specific articulations of the requirements of international humanitarian law, or IHL, in using weapons with autonomous functions or features. Second, good practices on human-machine interaction to avoid accidents and to ensure that force is used in accordance with the intentions of commanders and the operators of weapon systems, as my colleague Amanda discussed earlier today. Three, review processes, such as processes for the legal review of weapons, and four, risk assessments and mitigation measures. I would like to commend the organizers uh, for the title of this panel, which draws our attention to the fact that emerging technology can have a disruptive, game-changing effect that renders obsolete previous ways of doing business while enabling wholly new capabilities. There are many examples of this that we have all encountered in daily life. Uh, a very mundane one, uh, video cassette tapes were replaced by DVDs, which are being replaced by streaming video services. I have a collection of DVDs in my basement. I'm not sure what to do with them. Uh, new technologies can, of course, improve on the prior generation of technology. There's better picture quality. It doesn't take up space in your house. It can be less expensive. But new technologies also enable entirely new capabilities. When you use a streaming video service like Netflix, you're telling Netflix what you're watching, and it suggests similar things that you might enjoy watching based on your past history and preferences. It's a little creepy at first, uh, but it's convenient and helpful and gives you a new capability that was not possible before. Another observation regarding the strategic and military dimensions that I believe informs the GGE's work is that there is considerable uncertainty about the future of technological progress. It often may be difficult to predict how technology will develop or what will be possible. 
it may be quite difficult to predict how people will use new technologies. If you consider science fiction depictions from the past, you will see many things that we do not have that people expected that we would have today. I, for my part, am waiting for flying cars to be a thing. Yet there are also important transformative technologies and applications that were largely unanticipated by people in the past. The internet, social media, Twitter, Facebook. Despite considerable technological uncertainty, it seems very plausible that technological developments in artificial intelligence and other autonomy-related technologies will rival or exceed human performance at many activities and could lead to widespread changes on the scale of the Industrial Revolution. Although states are pursuing military applications of artificial intelligence and other autonomy-related technologies, these technologies are being developed in the commercial sector and are readily available and useful for a variety of non-military purposes. One aspect I would point out here is that this type of change isn't likely to be limited to one state, but could be broadly transformative. Almost every country in the world has computers and software. Military advantages from the use of artificial intelligence and on Autonomy related technologies include first, improved accuracy of decision making and information processing. For example, military forces might have surveillance footage from an observation drone, but there might not be enough intelligence analysts to watch all of the many hours of video that have been collected. Just like you can use Google to search images, intelligence analysts may want to search video footage to identify where insurgents may have dug holes in the road to plant improvised explosive devices. A second military... This will allow higher level control or supervision of multiple unmanned assets simultaneously and will increase effectiveness by reducing the operator's cognitive load allowing the operator to focus on command decisions and perform other high-level tasks. A third military advantage is improved precision and speed in using force in combat operations. For example, consider the CRAM, the counter rocket artillery and mortar system, which the United States has presented on in previous GGEs. This weapon system is a cannon that can shoot down incoming ro mortars and rockets. Computers, software, and sensors allow the control of a system that is more precise and faster than the manual control of the weapon system by a human gunner. Four more observations about these military advantages. First, these technologies have been used by militaries in some form for many years. For example, homing missiles have used automated target recognition and acquisition systems. Missile defense systems like the Aegis system have been fielded and used for decades. Second, whether weapons are characterized as autonomous can depend on how the system is used rather than the intrinsic capabilities or characteristics of the weapon system. For example, consider a, a missile with an automated target recognition capability that can select and engage enemy tanks. In one scenario, an operator identifies a specific target and fires the missile at this target. Under the definitions applied by the U.S. military, this would be a semi-autonomous weapon. The same weapon system and capability, however, could be classified as an autonomous system if it is used in a different way. If the operator does not identify a specific tank, but instead fires the weapon to loiter in an area and autonomously select and engage tanks that may appear, the weapon is classified as an autonomous weapon in U.S. military practice. The point I'm trying to illustrate is that the weapon system's technical characteristics are the same, but how it is used changes whether it is classified as autonomous or semi-autonomous. Third observation. The reliance on autonomous functions to aid in decision-making might not be intrinsically part of the weapon system. For example, the United States has discussed in the GGE the use of counter-battery radar systems that identify the location from which incoming fire originates, these systems can be used to, to direct counter-battery fire. 
This isn't a weapon system as such, but is an application of technology that informs human decision making in combat operations. Consider this analogy. You can use automation to help you steer a car. You can also use artificial intelligence to tell you where to drive with a mapping application on your phone that tells you how to get there with the least amount of traffic. This is perhaps what Ambassador Biontino was referring to in considering the use of autonomy in other aspects of the targeting cycle. My point is that the mapping application is on your phone. It's not necessarily in your car. My fourth point is that military advantages from these technologies can enhance the implementation of IHL in military operations, such as reducing the risk of civilian casualties. Such humanitarian benefits may include, for example, increasing awareness of civilians and civilian objects on the battlefield and reducing the need for immediate fires and self-defense. In many instances, civilian casualties are caused because commanders and operators were not aware of the presence of civilians and civilian objects. Use of artificial intelligence can improve situational awareness and the detection of civilians and civilian objects. People have raised concern about the use of AI or autonomy to identify individuals. But this technical capability is actually something that could be used to help reduce civilian harm. Another situation in which civilians are at increased risk is when military forces are in contact with the enemy and need to respond to enemy fires and self-defense. In those operational situations, the imperative to take immediate action to counter a threat from the enemy reduces the time available to take precautions to reduce the risk of civilian casualties. Existing practice, however, suggests that emerging technologies may offer ways to reduce civilian casualties in the situation. First, the use of robotic and autonomous systems can reduce the need for immediate self-defense fires by reducing the exposure of human beings to hostile fire. For example, remotely piloted aircraft or ground robots have been used to scout ahead of forces conducting patrols in environments where they might be subject to ambushes or roadside bombs. Robotic and autonomous systems can provide greater standoff distance from enemy formations, allowing forces to exercise tactical patience to reduce the risk of civilian casualties. Second, technologies can automatically identify the direction and location of incoming fire and thus can reduce the risk of misidentifying the location or source of, it, of threats. Third, the use of defensive autonomous systems to counter incoming rockets, artillery, and mortar can provide forces additional time to develop a considered response to the enemy threat as opposed to responding immediately with counter-battery fire. The United States discussed these and other humanitarian applications in a working paper that we submitted to the GGE in 2018. Now we'd like to discuss how these strategic and military dimensions could inform the work of the GGE. First, I'd like to pick up on a point that Ambassador Candeas mentioned at the opening of our seminar about the differences between laws and other types of weapons that have been the subject of arms control. In light of those differences, it may be questionable whether traditional disarmament approaches, the things that have been applied to nuclear, chemical, or biological weapons, can be applied automatically to laws. Moreover, rather than analogous to weapons with little military importance, for example, weapons that injure by fragments non-detectable by X-ray prohibited by CCW Protocol 1, these technologies may have potential game-changing effects and are currently employed in many military systems, such as combat aircraft, warships, and missiles. The commercial sector's development of these technologies and their many non-military purposes also suggest that the underlying components, for example, computers, software, and sensors, that distinguish autonomous weapons are not easily subject to the same types of arms control restrictions that have been used, for example, in relation to chemical weapons. The potential for emerging technologies to reduce the risk of civilian casualties also counsels against simply seeking to ban these technologies or their military applications. These are the technologies that can be used to create more discriminative effects. Although traditional <coughs> disarmament approaches might not be successful, the GGE can, in my opinion, usefully elaborate and develop its work in at least four areas. 
that I mentioned previously. One, more granular interpretations of IHL. Two, good practices on human-machine interaction. Three, review processes. And four, risk assessments and mitigation measures. First, <clears throat> uncertainty about the course of technological progress does not affect the applicability of IHL which, as guiding principle A, adopted by the GGE recognizes, and as the distinguished ambassador from Austria also reminded us in the last panel, IHL continues to apply fully to all weapon systems, including the potential development and use of laws. The 2019 GGE focused on IHL, usefully adding it as a specific agenda topic, and produced nine consensus substantive conclusions on this issue. More work on IHL is possible to clarify IHL requirements. In our working paper submitted in March 2019, the United States discusses what IHL requires in three specific scenarios for the use of autonomy in weapon systems. In our opinion, the GGE should continue to develop more granular, common understandings of how IHL applies to the use of systems based on emerging technologies in the area of loss. Focusing on more specific use scenarios is perhaps one way to develop more clear and granular conclusions. Second, our work on IHL should be informed by discussions on good practices on human-machine interaction. As Guiding Principle C, adopted by the GGE in 2019, recognizes, human-machine interaction may take various forms and be implemented at various, sta various stages of the life cycle of a weapon, and a range of factors should be considered in determining the quality and extent of human-machine interaction. The GGE can usefully elaborate on, on these factors and potential good practices. The United States would welcome the opportunity that Ambassador Cochrane proposed, and which Kathleen from the ICRC also highlighted in our last panel, to submit our practice in this area and to learn from the practice of other states. Third, review processes allow decisions to be made on a case-by-case -case basis in the prevailing circumstances and thus can addr help address the technological uncertainty surrounding emerging technologies in the area of laws. The GGE has emphasized guiding principle E, which restates the obligation to conduct legal reviews found in Article 36 of the 1977 Additional Protocol 1 to the 1949 Geneva Conventions. Although the United States is not a party to the 1977 Additional Protocol 1, the U.S. military engages in a regular practice of reviewing weapons before they are acquired or procured to ensure their com consistency with applicable international law. We think it would be productive for the GGE to seek to compile good practices in the legal review of weapons based on emerging technologies in the area of loss. Fourth, risk assessments and mitigation measures provide another way to help address uncertainty and to balance competing benefits and risks. Our colleague Yokoyama from Japan mentioned this approach. In Japan's practice regarding safety requirements for personal care robots, as well as Japan's AI utilization guidelines. The idea is to keep the benefits of emerging technologies, but also to take deliberate steps to address and minimize risks. The GGE's guiding principle G, which was also highlighted for us in the first panel, provides that risks, assessments, and mitigation measures should be part of the design, development, testing, and deployment cycle of emerging technologies in any weapon systems. And paragraphs 23A and B of the GGE's 2019 report discuss types of risks to be considered and potential mitigation measures. Further work on risk assessment processes and mitigation measures could allow the GGE to provide practical and implementable recommendations for states to address a variety of concerns. These areas that I've mentioned, articulating IHL requirements with more specificity, good practices on human-machine interaction, review processes, and risk assessments and mitigation measures are very much interrelated. This morning, our colleague Pamela from Chile asked a very thoughtful question about the limits of weapons reviews. 
and I want to address her question in the spirit of building bridges. Weapons reviews aren't alone the solution, but when we combine them with other aspects of our framework, I think the utility of weapons reviews becomes more apparent. Weapons reviews lead states to consider all of these issues at an early stage of their work in implementing IHL. For example, in conducting a legal review process, there will be a risk assessment. There will be consider consideration and analysis of what IHL requires, what it takes to require with, <coughs> pardon me, what it takes to comply with IHL. And there will be an analysis and discussion of what good practices in human machine interaction are available to comply with IHL and to mitigate any risks that have been identified. In conclusion, I would just like to emphasize a few points. This issue from the perspective of the United States is an important one. States are going to use emerging technologies of, in the area of laws in military operations. How do states use these technologies responsibly, ethically, and in accordance with international humanitarian law? The GGE is an incredible opportunity to have all states that are willing to participate, as well as civil society organizations, to discuss this issue and, borrowing the language from our mandate, to clarify, consider, and develop aspects of the normative and operational framework. The United States wants the GGE to be successful and to have a, a robust substantive outcome. The GGE has already made tremendous progress in terms of the 11 guiding principles and in terms of the substantive conclusions that have been adopted by consensus. And the U.S. delegation is ready to work constructively to continue that progress over the next two years under the leadership of Ambassador Kirklands and others. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor, for your enlightened um, exposition and for uh, the precision with the use of time. Before giving the floor to Dr. Roberto Gallo, I would just like to make an announcement that uh, FUNAG is really working on this issue. As you know, uh, in the last issue of Cadernos de Política Exterior, uh, there is an article about the challenges uh, of uh, in AI from the point of view of international humanitarian law. So I, I highly recommend uh, for those who read Portuguese, uh, to have an, uh, this uh, interesting assessment. Uh, Dr. Roberto Gallo, o senhor tem a palavra. Thank you very much. It's an honor to try to contribute to this uh, discussion. I will search to Portuguese so that I can spare you from my English. Almirante Álvaro Monteiro, Presidente Giuseppe, Embaixador Sandro Candeias. Thank you very much for the opportunity. After contributing, after your brilliant contributions from the from the different panel uh, panelists, I just have to add a simple perspective here. On the other side, I see that many panelists are have a government link, and sometimes they are not that free to discuss. Uh, as, they as they wish they, they, they could. I represent the Brazilian Industry of Defense Materials, and this association has over 200 companies. But I'm here as a professional that has been working for nearly 20 years now. I have a technical background in defense, security, and intelligence. I'm trying to draw a view that is a bit, a bit more free in terms of necessity of alignment with the government positions. After this quick disclaimer, could you please play the presentation? So after this quick disclaimer, I'd like to try and imagine in a free way the, the, all, all the consequences of the use of laws. Be uh, those laws regulated, regulated or not. There are basically three groups of or three axes that deserve some kind of reflection, some kind of thought. First is the idea of friction of use. When we talk about conventional weapon systems, 
or classic conception, the use of such systems is related, is normally related to an offensive nation. Uh, the, 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 the combatant's life is at risk, and this option, for, in, for instance, with the use of extensive laws, the extensive use of laws can be reduced. Imagine going to the battlefield in an offensive operation without, without placing any life in the line. This can increase, especially in societies that are more tolerant to the loss of life of the enemy and zero tolerant to the loss of lives of allies, of the nationals. This can increase appetite to risk and appetite to being offensive. Is this reasonable? Maybe the kind of thought that, should, that we should uh, have here is the accountability of the of the troops, of the commander, of the engineer, has a lot less impact on the public opinion than the death of a fighter that goes back home in a coffin covered by the flag. To what extent to battles, wars, conflicts are not uh, uh, made just because of the impact of public opinion? We know that in many countries that is a point that makes a whole difference. Perhaps, in a, a countermeasure, would be employment of laws should be made only against other equipment of same nature or against a big platform. Prohibited the use of uh, a, a lonely ground troop. We're not talking about proportionality here. It's a bit different still. It's about the effects on public opinion, on the decision, on the, the guy that takes political and strategic decisions. Another aspect, and I think I consider it to be relevant, is the idea that with laws, perhaps we could have the transportation of, from, of, from the mercenary to the robotic world. Nowadays, for a nation to have a, a full, I mean, a complex weapon system, there is a high capex, and during the life cycle of the defense material, they, are, they, they spend money. And if you have autonomous systems, which have a high level of integration that require little training from the combatant, because there's a loop here, there's the, the, the chance that systems of such kind uh, non-aligned states will provide that to third parties or to, ter or to terrorists or, or paramilitary. It increases a lot. When are we going to see the phenomenon of the mercenary? It sounds kind of lame, but a robotic mercenary. That's a risk. We have to consider that. The third point is if you, if you, if you consider uh, an aircraft of 30 years ago, a 30-year-old aircraft, once I bought the aircraft, I don't necessarily need to to, to go for support, to use uh, manufacturer support ever again. With the employment of laws and the software uh, authorizations, the way things are built allows us to uh, charge periodically in the form of, of OPEX. So there can be forms of use of equipment or with weapon systems, even for ally states that are diluted in time in terms of payment, thus allowing states that didn't used to have states access to uh, uh, um, weapons, uh, to have access to uh, strategically uh, interesting weapons for whom. And if, just to close up this first part, it has to do with a potential reduction of necessity of military training. Today, a combat pilot, speaking about aviation, this guy knows a lot about his aircraft, and he needs to. If, a, if one component stop, stops working, they, they will find a way around. We're going to speak uh, a little ahead about an interesting case, but when you need to train if there's uh, operational capacity and the systems are no longer available, either for delegation of the negation of technological use or any other reason, 
the training of the force is going to be lower and less able to fight uh, the lack of war equipment. So there can be a decrease of readiness level when you're facing the technology provider. For big nations with logistics, with a complete logistics cha chain like China, United States, this problem is a little smaller, is a bit smaller. But in nations like Brazil and other countries where supply chain is quite reduced, this is a severe problem from the strategic standpoint. What kind of guarantee does my weapon system have to be available for me to use? In the recent history, we have cases in our border, uh, right here in the Malvines. We know the case that when a conflict in the, in the UK, the Argentinians were denegated they had the, the, the denegated the use of, of, mis, of Exocet missiles by the French partner. The French were allied to NATO. I'm not going to give you the codes to attack with an objective uh, allied. And Argentinians found a way. I'm not, I'm not sure if it was reverse engineering. They, they, they fired the, missile, the, the missiles, and there was some difference. In the recent memory, at least in this continent or this region, the, den the technological den den denegation is exercised from time to time. We need to keep this kind of thought, but way more severe than the simple uh, te te technology denials. Ambassador Candeias mentioned this in the opening of technological captivity which can be expressed in the full inability of use of a weapon system and more than that. An autonomous weapon system can be a traitor that operates against the objectives of the system owner. <coughs> How can we mitigate that? Shouldn't that be a war crime? Maybe not denegating, but making the system Flip, maybe yes, maybe not, but it's something that should be discussed. That's the case of the, the, the Malvin Wars was in this in this sense. So I'd like to talk about the, the likelihood of for that to happen. It's for us Brazilians, this seems to be far. I have some numbers from the airspace. In the aerospace industry, 2% uh, of, the, of the compo aircraft components uh, had intervention in the supply chain. 46% of DOD suppliers had uh, supply chain uh, attacks. They had issues with uh, Troy horses. Instead of in, in critical, critical software pieces like F-16, F-17, this number is not really disclosed. I was admitted to UCOM. We're going to be we're going to be connected in a, in a moment. I was the only foreigner that were military from everywhere, uh, and I was admitted. Well, there are some very interesting figures there, showing that this this is a, this is a concrete problem. Here, there's an attempt of the American government to try and break the kind of issue. DARPA released a while ago a program, a program called SHIELD. How can I make sure that the logistics chain is under my control and the equipment that I receive is not going to be absent when I need it and it's not going to, uh, to turn against me in the future? Speaking about uh, INSA, what is intervention of supply chain? That's the capacity of, of impacting anything, the project, uh, develop, development, equipment transportation to invert its use. This is done systematically in the world. You have an excellent example. example of NSA operating with a, a, a technical supply, a technical group. This, this is top secret. This is leaked by Snowden, so it's public. Uh, changing Cisco equipment, Cisco equipment in the supply chain. If this was made with a civilian target or an information target, because that would never be done, 
programa militar. Against a military program, of course it is done. You can think otherwise. So the interesting thing about this is that this is done with the support of the industry, has been stated by NSA, uh, top secret slide. This is not strange, this is not fake. The issue is that for potential targets, and here we are, Brazilian people and other nations, how do we protect ourselves? How do we maintain the reasonability of the use of the systems? And the last effect that I would like to mention is that I call the weaponization of cyberspace. This third item has to be do with the understanding that the countermeasures of cost and benefits against laws in general would be cyber electronic war measures. They're very easy to obtain in terms of investment. Many nations and states with very low budget for defense go after this technology, and they're very effective. The, uh, prob I could give examples. Recently, in 2017, in, with uh, North American drones on serious space, what did the Russians do? They uh, they attacked half of the fleet and half of the other half. They were and they landed on the base. So this kind of action allowed that the American army start to have combat units, uh, cyber electronic in all the brigades, if I'm not mistaken. This kind of technology, this kind of capability has been disclosed in the whole world. This is an Australian institute that does the same, and which is the, it, their scope to work by cybernetics through electronic war. The problem is that weapon cybernetic, cyber knowledge that are offensive they leak, and they go to the wrong people's hands. Here, just reminding you, because this is important, because laws are a cybernetic, since the planning of a mission, the sensor command and control. So if they're essentially cybernetic, because the cynetic and cybernetic uh, aspects, the weapons that were researched, for cybernetic combat may fall into the hands of civilians, terrorist groups, and being used against non-military targets. Very easily. This is another case of NSA where cybernetic weapons uh, projected by the agency and were used by other nations and by civilians. So the discussion that has been uh, taken here are in the best interest and the high values in order to have different opinions and do the certain thing. The, the provocation here was the following. OK, not always the players are doing this. That is, I wouldn't say all the governments, but many governments and many states have specific agencies to do things that are at least grayish. That is intelligent activity that is essentially this. In this context, which types, if we are, have space, what kind of provisions can we have in the international law? That is basically my question. I thank you very much for your time and attention. 17 minutes. I will keep three. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Roberto, for your excellent provocation and presentation. Pass the floor now. And considering the time keeping also, I pass the floor to General Consul of China, Mr. Chen Yongkang. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, good afternoon. Excellencias, uh, caros convidados. Senores, senores, bodas. Uh, first of all, I would like we would like to thank Brazil for hosting the real seminar and for your kind invitation. 
Here, I would like to share with you the statement by Chinese delegation on the strategic and military dimensions of laws. As a product of new techno te technological development and military revolution, laws is one of the concrete examples of military application of AI technologies. Nowadays, the strategic and military dimensions of laws draws much international attention, and the humanitarian, legal, and ethical results that in my course have also raised concern of the world. However, there are different viewpoints in this regard. Some parties are worried that laws will lower the threshold of war by reducing the cost and casualties of war, and thus will increase the possibility and frequency of using force. Some are worried about the challenge to the international security system brought by the results such as arms race, proliferation, and abuse that might be triggered by laws. In particular, laws may cause disastrous consequences when they fall into the hands of the non-state actors and the terrorist organizations. Meanwhile, some believe that laws have advantages in terms of cost-effective ratio, time of reaction, collateral casualties, and application environment, enabling them to help or partly substitute human work to effectively avoid humanitarian disaster. Some consider that it's hard to make conclusions at this stage since the technologies applicable to laws are complicated and developing very fast, and their future are quite uncertain. The Chinese side supports the international community to discuss the law's issues in order to give an objective and comprehensive assessment of their implications, and then formulate relevant international rules through negotiation, so as to make best use of the advantages and bypass the disadvantages. Meanwhile, considering that the new technologies applicable to laws are dual and use, a dual use and nature, which could serve for both military and civilian purposes. We should respect the right of peaceful use shared by all states, so as not to hinder the scientific and technological development and social progress, let alone to set discrimin discriminatory technical barriers using the excuse of non-proliferation to harm the legitimate and equal rights of the developing countries to access to the new technology. It is significant to establish the group of governmental experts, GGE, of laws and the framework of the Convention on Certain Conventional Weapons, CCW, to discuss the issues of technology, military use, and international laws application of such weapon systems. The Chinese side commends the GGE for agreeing on the 11 guiding principles, which offer basic guidelines to regulate the development directions of laws. We are glad to see that last year, the CCW, high contracting parties, unanimously adopted the new mandate for the GGE to continue to discuss the relevant experts of laws. China has always participated actively and the related international discussion and work of the GGE in a constructive manner, including putting forward the Chinese proposals on the characteristics of laws. We stand ready to continue exchange with all parties and a bid to make contributions to reaching more common ground on laws. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Council. Um, so I give the floor immediately to Dr. Moa Carlson from the CIPRI. You have the floor. Thank you so much. First of all, I would like to thank the Brazilian government and especially Alessandro for this kind invitation. I feel very honored to be here and to talk to you today about autonomous weapon systems and strategic stability. 
So, my name is Moa Pelan Carlson, and I work at the Stockholm International Peace Research Institute, CIPRI, with emerging technologies, meaning I very closely follow the development of these weapons, as well as the CCW process in Geneva. So, the topic of my presentation is how autonomous weapon systems are impacting strategic stability and global security. And there are thorough discussions and research today on the legal, ethical, and operational implications of these technologies, as we have seen extensively throughout the day and the different panels. However, the aspect of strategic stability is sometimes overlooked and considered less important. And the CCW discussion today focuses on the humanitarian risk in armed conflict posed by these weapons. But the military use of these weapons could also have an effect outside of the armed conflict context. And the CCW could play an important role in mitigating the risk on, of autonomous weapon systems undermining strategic stability. So the purpose of my presentation is to explore how the development of autonomy in weapon systems could work to undermine the strategic stability. How could it, and how it could possibly increase the risk of a nuclear launch? And so why am I talking about this in the context of the CCW? It is because the CCW and the way it sets norms, guiding principles, and frameworks could, as I said, help mitigating the risk of these technologies bringing instability around the world. So it's going to be a food for thought for why it would be an important thing to agree on a form of regulation of these autonomous weapon systems. And what I'm going to talk about is based on the CIPRI study, the impact of artificial intelligence on strategic stability and nuclear risk. This has been a two-year-long research project with three reports. And two of these are already published. And the third one is coming out later this year. And if you want to know more and have more specific examples of what I'm saying, I highly recommend you to read these reports. I brought some of them. I put them outside. There are only a few, but you can also find them on the CIPRI website. So when talking about strategic stability specifically, it helps to talk about autonomy in weapon systems rather than autonomous weapon systems, and to go beyond the commonly used ICRC definitions of autonomy and the critical functions. So at CIPRI, we usually use the term autonomy in weapon systems to get a better sense of how this technology is being used in different applications and highlight the fact that we're not talking about specific weapons, but of a technology. And what is strategic stability? It is a state of affairs in which countries are confident that their adversaries would not be able to undermine their nuclear deterrent capability using nuclear conventional or other non-conventional means. So originally, this is a Cold War term for the absence of incentives to launch a first nuclear strike. And there are different understandings of strategic stability today, but this is the definition that we've used. And strategic stability is achieved by mutually assured destruction, MAD, meaning that if both sides have and are confident in their own and each other's ability to retaliate against a first nuclear strike, or any type of highly destructive attack. They wouldn't feel the need to build up their arsenals, and most importantly, they wouldn't be under pressure to launch their missiles in a crisis. So strategic stability depends on two necessities. The first one is the need to possess these second strike capabilities, and the second one is to ensure that this retaliatory capability is credible, effective, and survivable. You can't see the text very well, but I hope you get the picture. This visual explains how AI and machine learning could be used in nuclear deterrence in different applications. And AI and automation have already been part of the nuclear realm for decades, but this shows how the recent advances of this technology could bring uh, transformative impacts. So machine learning could boost detection capabilities, improve analysis of ISR data, and enhance the protection of command and control. It could also be used to conduct 
remote sensing operations in areas that are hardly accessible for manned or remotely controlled systems, such as in the deep sea. And this could be seen by nuclear weapon states as an alternative to ICBMs and submarines for nuclear weapon delivery. It could also be used to boost the capabilities of non-nuclear means of deterrence, like air defense systems, UAVs, and autonomous anti-submarine systems. And perhaps this is the most relevant part for the CCW, as there, these are conventional weapons that still play a part in the nuclear realm. So the connection between conventional and nuclear weapons is my key point, because the development of autonomy in weapons systems could be seen as a driver of the entanglement between these two areas. So what I mean here is as the capabilities of conventional arms rise, it becomes more feasible to use them to hold nuclear assets at risk. So autonomy is one such advanced capability, which would feed into the increasing entanglement and in turn, the increasing strategic instability. And there is also an increasing political willingness to use nuclear means to retaliate against non-nuclear attacks. So if we go into the destabilizing effects on strategic stability, these technologies in weapon systems could first of all, simply reinforce a symmetry between states and undermine the status quo of deterrence relationships. They could also incentivize states to respond with destabilizing measures, like I just mentioned. And these responses could include entering into an arms race, investing in modernization of nuclear arsenals, renouncing a no first use policy, increase alert statuses, or further automating nuclear launch policies. And perhaps, the most important destabilizing effect has to do with perception rather than the actual development of these weapon systems. Because states don't actually have to acquire these technologies to challenge the strategic stability. The perceived adoption of new capabilities by one state could make another fear for their uh, survivability and reliability of their nuclear deterrents. So this would thereby motivate the concerned states to respond with the measures that I just mentioned. Another risk for strategic instability has to do with the increased speed of warfare and a lower threshold of war. So as these technologies increases the speed of decision making, it calls for more unstable decisions and accidental escalations. So the worst case scenario would be that the fear of losing quickly due to the increased speed that these technologies bring leads to a first strike instability. And regarding the lower threshold of war, as these technologies are pretty easy to develop, it becomes easy for many actors to develop them, which leads to instability possibility, possibly. So these destabilizing effects could lead to accidental, inadvertent, and deliberate escalations. So apart from the increased speed of warfare, with less time for decision making, accidental escalations could emerge because these new technologies in weapon systems are still brittle and we don't know exactly how they will operate. And concerning this issue of perception, there could also be inadvertent or deliberate escalations. So inadvertent escalation means that it is an intentional action to increase the intensity or scope of conflict but it's interpreted to have crossed the threshold by an adversary. And it's different from accidental escalation because the decision to escalate is intentional. And deliberate escalation is an intentional action to increase the intensity or scope of conflict. So examples of when these escalations could happen is when an autonomous vehicle deployed for remote sensing is mistaken for an armed system intended to conduct an attack or when an autonomous armed platform carrying a conventional payload uh, for a strike mission is suspecting of carrying <coughs> excuse me, a nuclear weapon, or when a nuclear armed state decides to launch a preventive first strike based on AI-generated information indicating that an enemy might be planning an attack.
So there's also the possibility that these developments of autonomy and weapon systems could have stabilizing effects as well. And, and I will not go much into these, because but they could be worth mentioning to have a balanced discussion. So these developments could reinforce a sort of acceptance of mutual vulnerability between states. It could also give states better uh, confidence that they are better prepared to deal with a crisis, as they would have better information and decision-making tools, and possibly better possibilities to monitor threats and risks. But concludingly, one can say that whether the development of autonomy brings Stability or instability depends on the context. Yes, so after assessing how the development of autonomy in weapon systems impacts the strategic stability, the question remains how seriously we should take this risk. And one conclusion drawn from our research is that autonomy in weapon systems alone would not be enough to trigger an escalation. So other factors such as geopolitical tension or lack of communication and signaling of intentions would also play key roles. However, there is still a risk at hand which should be taken seriously. So in our research, we assess the kind of risks there are and what can be done to mitigate these risks. I'm really sad that you can't read these. <laughs> um, and here is where it becomes highly relevant for the CCW because, I'm going to read this to you, it says, commitment on responsible use of AI technology, e.g. on human control. So this commitment could be a way of mitigating the risk of undermining strategic stability. So agreeing on a regulation of human control or human element or human judgment, if you will, over autonomous weapon systems. And this would probably not be the only thing required, but it could one, be one step of the way and one important step away, it could be a path definer for the future. So just to sum up my presentation, the three key takeaways could be, one, that autonomy in weapon systems could work as a driver for the entanglement between conventional weapons and nuclear weapons, and two, that there doesn't have to be an actual development of these technologies to, to risk undermining strategic stability, but the mere perception of another state developing these technologies could lead to escalations. And so three, therefore, it would be beneficial to agree on regulations of these technologies. And here I want to come back to what I said in the beginning, that the CCW and the way it sets norms, uh, guiding principles and frameworks could help mitigating the risk of these technologies bringing instability around the world. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Carlson. Um, I would like to re recall everyone that if you want to send questions in written, please feel free to do that. Uh, passo então a palavra ao nosso último panelista, o vice-almirante Alfredo Muradas, diretor de sistemas de armas da Marinha do Brasil. Brazilian Navy, Your Excellency, you have the floor. Thank you very much. First off, I would like to thank the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Ministry of Defense, Foundation Alexandre Guzmão, the Navy War College, the Center, the Center of Strategic Political Studies of the Navy, and a special thank you to Admiral Oscar Monteiro, Ambassador Candeias, for the initiative and for having me here. I also congratulate all, all panelists for your great presentations, allowed us to broaden the knowledge on the topic, and I hope it helps everyone to make the best judgment uh, about about the topic and I greet all the panelists who have just contributed so I could learn a little more on the topic. I highlight that I'm here in this meeting as a tech, as a military technician that has been working for a while in the Navy systems area, and my observations are not institutions. In addition to the rather personal ones on my experience that I'd like to share with you today. 
My, um, as, uh, there are many officials here, many aspirants here. I, uh, Mick Round is in uh, guns, uh, guns enabling systems, it's a specialization I have. Uh, I spent nine years on onshore. In, a, in ships, then I took a perfection. I, I took a course, a professional course. I worked in this area, and then I, 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 I took a master's in AI here in the Military Institute of, of Engineering. Uh, it's been 20, it's been 25 years. I don't want to say my my age, but I've been working in the Navy, Navy, Navy systems of the Navy, tactical systems command and control combat, different perspectives, since maintenance of software, systems maintenance, integration, development, acceptance, research, operational assessment, and so on and so forth, and also in infrastructure. So when I was invited by Admiral Monteiro and Ambassador Candeias, I thought, how could I contribute to the discussion? And right now, in this regard, in this perspective, that I, I like to, to, to contribute in this military perspective from someone who's been working in the systems area for guns uh, for a while now, and how we can help in this uh, regard. So, So I would like to start off by mentioning how important uh, complying with international law, important the duties, responsibilities, principles, and also the, the ethical, ethical principles involved. How relevant the topic is for the international community with participants from many countries, like we see here today, from many of the industries related to the topic, and then many areas concerned with the topic, and I really see this debate as very profitable from different industries so we can help in creating a judgment. And I saw this event as an opportunity to learn and participate and also to contribute with Ambassador Candeias and his team to help uh, bringing a judgment for Brazilian for the Brazilian state. This, this discussion is very important. They're being headed uh, by initiative of, of Ambassador Candeias, both intra, uh, both inside and outside ministries. And CCW is a group of experts, government experts. The, the, that's the uh, proper forum for this discussion. I would like to ask you to ask you guys for your understanding. I haven't joined the discussions. I can commit. A, uh, uh, I can be wrong regarding concepts, but I will try to be as precise as possible in my ideas. And it's very important to have a discussion of, discussion of, of the discussion of concepts. They are relevant for. I mean, so we can uh, so we can raise judgments. I mean, this, that's, that's always the beginning of discussions, but they can be perfected um, in the course of the process. And I see that as a big challenge. I mean, the tech evolution that we see nowadays compared to the time required to discuss a regulating instrument or any any other kind of instrument, not only the area of autonomous areas, uh, auto, autonomous weapons, I'm sorry, in the knowledge area, I mean, how to, how can you really bring up a legislation that uh, can, can, can create a legislation that tackles, tackles these. This is industry, technology, society, industry produces, it goes to society, and then when it, when it starts to be employed, then do you need to mature that, and then there comes legislation or regulation. So the process is way slower. The cultural, cultural assimilation of the behaviors, of the arising behavior is way slower than tech evolution. This is in all areas. So the discussion started in 2014, and technology uh, still evolves. 
there is a consequence because after the behavioral change of society, there many times is unknown. I mean, technology advances and people don't know how, and we don't know how society, each knowledge area is going to employ the technology. So that uh, hinders regulation. And when we, when we talk about uh, AI, when the possibilities are countless, it is even hard to predict where we're going where, where to go, where we, the point we're going to reach. This is really hard. How can you come up with a regulating instrument that complies with the humanitarian, international humanitarian law that is able to follow the technological evolution and does not generate any, generate any asymmetry who can and who cannot follow the technological evolution. I'd like to make this comment. Brazil doesn't have any legislation. There are discussions involving laws or uh, similar weapons. But we are concerned in our constitution on the prevalence of human rights, equality between states, the defense of peace, of the peaceful solution of uh, conflicts, cooperation for progress. And in our constitution, we have the importance of armed forces, of military, as, for, as national forces for the defense of the country. So there's a whole legislation. Uh, on defense. Additionally, also uh, on, te on uh, science and technology, we are now discussing a uh, bill on the milestone of, of AI. And in, Brazil, in the Brazilian Navy, created a new strategy of science and technology, which is quite recent. But what I'd like to show you guys is that we have to do, we have to comply with international, international military law. And the train of constitution, I mean, have to prepare uh, military and the constitution against new uh, threats, laws, that do, uh, that shows the threats and not to hinder access, access to technology. So research and development in many technologies that end up being somehow, um, I mean, they end up, they don't have any connection with, with that kind of weapon. As we can also see that many areas of knowledge have equipment with different levels of automation or autonomy as taxonomy was chosen, but this is, this is, this is, this is growing, it's been advancing at high speed, and many times that evolution presents possibilities, including AI, because it, it, because it is powered. It is hard to absorb or employ before raising culture, raising awareness, before there's a coexistence of all of those possibilities. And when we see AI progressing in this regard, we also have to see that there's, I mean, those who operate or, or employ AI, they have to, tra to be trained because they have to understand what they do, not just delegate, assign activities to others. When we use an equipment that has some kind of, of non-human intelligence, but AI intelligence, but it is important to, to check if the behavior that is uh, that inc including that embedded in that equipment complies with what it um, with what was anticipated. So as, as we saw before the brilliant presentation on AI that it facilitates the use, it facilitates usage, but it, um, it takes, us, uh, takes us away from, easy, from the activities. And you have, have to be aware of, the, of, all, of what we're doing. You can't see this uh, distance from basic uh, functions, but there's a complexity to see if the expected functions are being complied. So it is important to employ technologies as I've mentioned, to ensure international humanitarian law, humanitarian law with technological advancement, avoiding asymmetries. When I talk about technologies, I mean robotics, and robotics, AI, big data, um, pattern, uh, center learnings, and many others. Some Pertinent aspects in the military area. I understand that is, that, that's very important. 
emitir o juízo, vou fechar a questão, porque a necessidade aprofundada. I mean, the, the necessary dependency, definitions on men, men, uh, men, men, machine, uh, men, human machine in the interaction, discussion on tasks and duties and responsibilities of, of the stakeholders in the process, of any kind of weapon that has any kind of, of automation or autonomy, the presence of the decision, the presence of decision making in the loop can be related many times to the responsibility that the, the responsibility that this definition of responsibility is very important so you can take, so you can uh, 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 go ahead and with, with this concern so we are concerned with with, uh, with uh, onshore people that the weapon systems are complying with what is expected from them so there are many security levels that we put in place in order to ensure um, in order to ensure the commoners of the ship commander so to guarantee the IHL well, all, uh, the autonomous weapons uh, can reduce um, uh, 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 threat response time. There's an equipment that has some kind of autonomy or semi-autonomy. And there are, there are military applications of AI and other, tech other emergency technologies that do not entail uh, non-lethal weapons. So the asymmetry itself is important as well. To be, uh, it has to be mentioned because if a country has another one doesn't have uh, the one that doesn't have the technology can face a situation that it uh, that requires um, uh, work. I mean, this asymmetry is also it is a factor that has to be uh, considered deeply considered while drafting regulating instruments. Low countries will need team to uh, uh, defend laws, nuclear, biological, chemical uh, defense. That is, if there is any kind of risk, also of non-state uh, players that are not subject to regulation that are on, in ongoing negotiation also regarding the proliferation or even acquisition or purchase of laws by other non-state players. So access to technology is more and more facilitated nowadays. So we still saw some pertinent aspects that are uh, doctrine and any kind of uh, weapon with autonomy or automation or semi-automatic may always impact in uh, review. And then once we have established all the uh, guidelines and the compliance of this, we, it is important to mention how to ensure the protection of the systems against any cyber attack, uh, virus, or any uh, mistakes in programming, and so on. Because more and more it's more difficult to establish the acceptance analysis of a system that may have some kind of intelligence, how to really ensure that they're doing what they were uh, designed for, and who will uh, certify this? I would like to conclude my words mentioning once again the premise on the care of the humanitarian uh, worldwide. Right is important for this technological uh, evolution that, that is permanent, this technology that is disruptive and more and more accessible, and the requirement to develop defense against these threats, and also we have to continue with our discussion regarding laws, and we hope that I have been very clear by my words. I thank you very much. Thank you very much, Admiral, for your words. A very inspiring presentation. Antes de passar a palavra ao público, gostaria de fazer perguntar se os panelistas gostariam de fazer perguntas para uns e outros. Não sei se vocês foram bastante provocados pelas falas tão desafiadoras.
Aparentemente não. A palavra está aberta. Ok. The floor is open. Whoever wants to ask a question or comment. I will ask my question in Portuguese. The question is simple. Considering we have experts from the army, do you think that perhaps it would be more productive to have a discussion on laws that we would be able to advance in the types of weapons that we're speaking about, the autonomy may be not in different levels, but in different modalities of weapons. So it's very difficult to discuss in an abstract approach without having clear scenarios. Responder? Okay, we'll take that. Roberto, então vamos. Uh, vamos responder em português. I will share my idea. We that belong to the computing world, we have a mania of trying to find mental uh, templates to explain things. I myself see the systems not because for what they represent, but because of their effects. And also, the results of the effects are quite uh, disseminated. That's what we call multiple heritage. It can be potatoes and many other things. So for the legal test, it can be OK, but for the understanding, not necessarily, but that's my opinion, mm, a quick opinion. I really appreciate the question. I really appreciate the question. I think that an important que realmente nos Estados Unidos tem prejudicado as discussões. É um impedimento que as pessoas não têm muita certeza do que estamos falando muitas vezes. E outros tipos de sistemas de armamento que são o sujeito da proibição, da discussão, minas e outras coisas, ou armas laser, que são parte do protocolo 4, Na, há um sentido mais claro sobre o sistema de armamento que estão falando das pessoas e isso realmente provoca uma proibição, uma regulamentação. E eu aprecio a sua pergunta porque realmente a captura um problema essencial é considerando o trabalho de, 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 na perspectiva dos Estados Unidos, uma das maneiras que tentamos abordar esse assunto é tentar é, nivelar a discussão numa situação mais realista. E os Estados Unidos têm apresentado muitos sistemas que usam autonomia no sistema de armamento para usar a frase de Cifre Collex, que ele de, o artilharia, sistema de morteiros, o ano passado... No GD. É, eu lembro que nós falamos sobre um sistema naval de contra minas que detecta a, as minas. Eu acho que algumas apresentações ainda estão online e gostaria de compartilhar com vocês, se quiserem. Mas, no nosso entendimento, que nós falamos sobre cenários realistas e, e considerações podem ajudar a formatar uma operação porque podemos falar especificamente sobre o que é necessário numa situação e não ter uma ideia metafísica ou abstrata sobre o homem e a máquina e a ética de, da tomada de decisões, mas ter uma discussão mais concreta num cenário. Vamos usar a autonomia dessa maneira para ajudar 
aos comandantes os operadores durante uma operação militar. E se é ESCO, está compro com a NHL, quais são as exigências? Então, eu acho que isso é uma maneira bastante potencial para a GGE é considerar, para continuar, como temos feito no passado, falando mais sobre sistemas existentes específicos que usam autonomia ou funções autônomas. Eu lembro de uma apresentação de um colega sueco no passado sobre alguns sistemas, e esses sistemas alavancavam realmente uma ótima discussão sobre o que a lei humanitária internacional exige. Eu quero ecoar o sentimento por trás dessa pergunta e ofereço para a consideração algumas ideias sobre como ele resolve isso. Bom, eu tenho um, algumas provocações, uma mais positiva, com a qual eu vou terminar, e a outra nem tanto. Vamos ver outras áreas da nossa vida, como o mercado financeiro, por exemplo, a inteligência artificial realmente é uma realidade e impôs um novo padrão sem nenhuma regulamentação. Não existe uma regulamentação. Os bancos e os think tanks começaram a usá-lo e pregá-lo, e é uma realidade, é um fato hoje em dia. Quando que esses países começaram a desenvolver e usar a inteligência artificial nas armas autônomas, nós tínhamos o risco de observar a mesma coisa na vida real para realmente ter dispositivos eficazes que não são regulamentados. O segundo comentário mais positivo é que hoje em dia nós sabemos que uma das dificuldades é que é o campo de batalha é pervasivo, existe em todos os lados. Estamos falando sobre zonas cinzentas, quando falamos sobre as guerras, guerra da quarta geração, também problemas em áreas urbanas, e algum grau de autonomia pode ajudar a reduzir, por exemplo, danos colaterais. Se você pensar que esse tipo de aplicabilidade pode ser desenvolvida dentro dos sistemas ou não. Posso responder? I believe this brings us back to the issue of not being able to sit down and see, wait and see. When you are in the financial market, its nature is that all the operations in general are reversible. Loss of lives and other kind of strategic losses are not like this. When a player has a strategic position, they don't adhere anymore to the treaties that limit strategic positions. So more for an issue of strategic positioning. Ah, if it would be at the front, I wouldn't observe any treaty. I would take the, the, the freedom of something that is not regulated. And if I had any kind of strategic advantage, I would not follow any kind of uh, barrier. So wait and see really doesn't doesn't work. It's not ideal for this. Perhaps we may have this kind of um, something in the middle. There are the sandboxes, as the banking system has, a set of situations where experiments are totally tolerated, but the deployment in a greater scale, not because the impact is much huger. So a middle term is more possible, including IA applying to the kind of thing. That's my opinion. Just out of the box. Today is the day of the out of the box. Could you repeat the end of your question, please? 
Two questions. The first has to do with the fact that in some areas, the absence of lack of regulation didn't avoid the development of autonomous weapons that really transform the reality of sectors in our lives. The financial sector is one of them. We have robots operating at a speed, a quite high speed practically doing operations with themselves. Fortunes are gained and lost very quickly because of this. Humans don't have the capability of working in such a short term. This regulation doesn't exist. The reality has imposed itself more, and the states have been able to establish and set a specific rules to regulate the use of IA. AI. So, in the financial market, <laughs> the uh, possible operations in the markets are regulated, but not the use of this technology. The question is if this may happen, or it is going to happen, in your opinion, in what we're talking about, safety and security, and specific defense. The second has to do with the possibility of using not only AI, but also the autonomy of the weapons as a tool for the reduction of collateral damage, considering that war nowadays takes place in urban places, and considering also there are a lot of problems for humans to identify the targets and so on. So at one point, the systems, including with a degree of autonomy, could be useful to avoid collateral damage. I see this uh, AI as a very broad view for possibilities, and many people, we all know how to use it uh, correctly. The, the possibilities are great, and they're more comprehensive. So truly, AI as a tool it shows itself knowing you know, or having the guidelines of its use. It, it can really work in the sense that you just mentioned with a reduction of collateral damage and also <coughs> increasing the precision and the way it is used. But this is, this context must be quite deepened because it depends in the operational environment and the, the reduction of damage will depend on the adequate use of it because eventually it would not behave as it is expected. So there is a, a process of assessment of its use. And therefore, the damage may also be greater. So I think there is an assessment of this, and perhaps this assessment becomes difficult to assess how it will behave in any situation. So it has to be very well analyzed and verified and tested because to reach this purpose of reducing the damage, it could be otherwise another problem. I will respond bastante e rapidamente sobre essa pergunta, mas a primeira nós vamos ter like we have the use of AI in civilian sphere today, if I understand correctly. Um, I believe yes, probably, if we don't regulate. So I think there is, we're standing at a very important threshold right now with the review conference. And I think there is a need for something to happen because right now the technology is developing faster than the regulations of it. And on the second question, could autonomy be used to minimize collateral damage? Yes, but it could also be used on the other, in the other way to um, maximize collateral damage. 
and that is way riskier. So that's why there should be some kind of regulation on the human control of these weapons. I would like to try to answer your, your first questions about uh, the AI technology. And uh, we should con fully consider the complex complexity of the issue of laws and take a pragmatic attitude to resolve the, the problem step by step. At this stage, we, we would like to uh, we should, uh, we should, uh, encourage every state to uh, strengthen the orientation and supervision about the concerned technology and industry. At this uh, area, uh, the Chinese side would like to share some, uh, some experience or um, poli um, uh, policy uh, measures. In 2017, Chinese government issued the development plan on the new generation of artificial intel intelligence AI technology. And this uh, plan uh, proposed the, uh, the uh, uh, laws and uh, ethical regulations on the development of AI industry, uh, including uh, 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 establish, in establishing the ethical judge structures and uh, formulate the uh, behavior regulations of the uh, personnel of research of the of the AI products and strengthen also the risk uh, evalu uh, evaluation. And nowadays, uh, uh, the Chinese side is uh, 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 is realizing this uh, uh, proposal. Uh, and besides the uh, associations and uh, of, of China in this area have also made some efforts in the self discipline uh, disciplining in 2018 uh, the China AI industry alliance also uh, uh, issued an important declaration uh, saying that uh, the AI technology should be uh, keep in uh, uh, essential principle to serving the people, uh, serving the humankind, and to uh, maintain the ethics, dignity, and human rights of all the uh, human being. And and this this uh, experience, I think we think it can uh, serve as reference of every states, and we also welcome every uh, other states to other sides to uh, strengthen the exchange and share experience on the basis of volunteer. Thank you. Thank you. You want to say some more? Yeah, if you want. So thank you for those excellent questions. Um, you know, I, th I think your first one about cons really sort of puts the finger uh, on the pulse of, of a public concern, right, which is that in, in some aspects in the private sector, there have been developments in artificial intelligence and technology and uh, I think there's been a public concern that, you know, uh, of an attitude of unregulation, uh, the kind of wild, wild west people moving ahead b before the rules and uh, are established and being dismissive of, of rules and, and legal regulation. Uh, and, and I think there have been concerns about that, of, uh, about the private sector and, and tech companies. Um, I actually think that's one area where the military um, is quite different from the private sector because the military begins with a set of rules, begins with international humanitarian law already incorporated into our procedures, already incorporated into our rules. You know, we in the U.S. Armed Forces, there are legal advisors that, that advise commanders d during military operations to, to ensure compliance with IHL. And so, you know, from the U.S. military's perspective, we start from the principle that all of our activities in armed conflict are governed by international humanitarian law, the laws of war, including any activities that may involve the use of artificial intelligence, uh, autonomous uh, functions and, and features in weapon systems. And so we start from a principle that, as reflected in the, in the GGE's guiding principle, that international humanitarian law continues to apply. Uh, and so you know, our, I think our, our perspective is it's perhaps, you know, more traditional and, and 
uh, rigid and, and inflexible than, than those in the private sector, uh, but it, it's, it's, it's one that begins from, from, from the assumption that, that there is law and, and we have to understand and apply this law carefully uh, to, to new developments. Um, so really appreciate your first question. Also, you know, just want to comment briefly on your second question as well. Um, you know, I, I, I mentioned in my presentation the working paper that the United States submitted to the GGE in 2018 on potential humanitarian benefits uh, of the use of autonomous weapon systems. Uh, and, and so you can uh, I encourage colleagues who are interested to, to consider that paper uh, with some ideas about uh, potential work in this area, you know, from the U.S. Uh, government's perspective, we, we do think that there's great promise in technologies to help better implement IHL and, and reduce the uh, risk of civilian casualties during military operations. Um, and, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I, I would also just take this opportunity to make a more informal observation. I, I was struck by what Ambassador, you know, Parklands was, was saying in, in, in the previous panel, you know, a lot of your perspective on this issue depends on how you think about two things. You know, what is your perspective on technology, and then what is your perspective on, on, on human nature? You know, the, the technology is this protean concept. It's uncertain. Uh, you know, it, it could be used for good purposes. It, it could be used for bad purposes. Um, the, you know, I, I think uh, our, our CIPRI colleague reminded us you could use these technologies to develop inherently indiscriminate weapons. You know, that has not happened yet in the perspective of the U.S. Uh, and, and from our point of view, it, it makes no military sense to develop a weapon that would cause more civilian casualties. That's, that's not militarily a, an effective weapon. In, instead, we want to use force as efficiently as possible, only, only striking military objectives. Um, but also this topic um, really reveals what you think about human nature. And uh, I'm, I'm a lawyer by trade, so I'm uh, accustomed to, to encountering the imperfections in human nature, where, where people make mistakes or, or uh, you know, uh, can do more to improve themselves. So uh, just would, would end with those uh, few informal observations. Thank you very much, Councillor. Um, we would have time for a final question, perhaps a tweet. <laughs> yes, well, two, please. Almirante Monteiro and the second one, no? Yes, please, if you want. To. Thank you. Hernan Estrada, I'm a former UN ambassador. Um, I hope it's the last question. I, I mean, I know everybody is tired, and uh, uh, but still, I uh, think that uh, from this panel, we have sensed a uh, very strong sense of urgency to do something. Uh, there are very concrete views that um, the use, the development of autonomous weapon systems uh, will have uh, big consequences for humanity, and, uh, and these consequences are, are, are mainly unknown. Uh, and since we are talking about uh, strategic stability, and one of the main pillar of the concept is to have confidence about the capabilities of uh, the enemy, of the states, uh, etc., how can we be confident uh, that the other party is having is having uh, the uh, the right amount of capabilities. How can militaries know what the capabilities are of their opponents if the technology is not regulated, is not known, and still we all agree that it will have enormous consequences for society? Um, yeah, thank you. Who wants to take the question? I can't really answer that question. I just want to say that I share your concern and that I believe that is why there is a need for a regulation because we don't know 
what the capabilities of other states are if there are no regulations. Like the issue of perception that I talked about, that you can think that and someone is developing these weapons and um, question your own capabilities and then it leads to escalations. So that was my point exactly, that if we don't have regulation, this leads to that sort of instability. Gostaria de contribuir também. Eu, eu entendo. Oh, sorry. Because AI will, will never replace human uh, intelligence, in my view. Because we have a, we have a wider situational awareness, but we have to go through this discussion, and we do have to reach some results, so to speak, because it opens a range of possibilities that we just don't know. It walks a path, but it doesn't replace, in my view, it doesn't, no way, I mean, there should be a way for you to really understand and some kind of control on how this is going to be used, what kind of limit of employment for IA do we have, for AI, AI I'm sorry, do we have? This, 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 has got, this has got to be discussed, just, just a note here. Então, com essa observação, eu peço, uh, eu uh, peço que vocês agradeçam os panelistas que querem aplausos.